I'm Alan Mathias, Dean Emeritus of the School of Medicine at USC, and I'm here to interview Arthur Donovan. Dr. Donovan is the Professor Emeritus of Surgery at USC and former chair of the department. Art, welcome. It's nice to have you here to talk to us about your experiences. Would you tell us a little of your early training as a surgeon? I, I served my surgical residency at Yale, New Haven, uh, <coughs> New Haven Hospital. When I completed my residency, I joined the faculty at Tufts in Boston with Dr. Gardner Child, a distinguished surgeon well known as for the Child's classification of liver disease. Uh, that was in 1955, and after a few years there, Dr. Child went to Michigan, and I went into practice in the Exeter Clinic in Exeter, New Hampshire. And in the uh, fall of 1960, it would be, uh, a Dr. Larry Crowley uh, came to visit me. He had trained a bit ahead of me at Yale and come to California, and he had eventually, he was then in half part-time practice in uh, Pomona and working half-time at USC uh, on the tumor service and on a large research project on estrogens in breast cancer, looking at estrogen metabolism and trying to correlate it with behavior of breast cancer. Uh, under the, this was under Dr. Ian McDonald and Paul Coton from Pathology. Uh, and he enticed me to come to California and join him in practice in Pomona and also working half-time at USC uh, on the uh, estrogen metabolism research project being supported by that through the NIH grant, uh, which was a large grant. Uh, I, in addition to going on the uh, tumor service at the county hospital, I also went on and, and served on as a voluntary faculty on one of the uh, general surgical services at the county hospital. Could you describe a little uh, about uh, the voluntary faculty uh, at the uh, county hospital when you were there? The voluntary faculty uh, had been, <coughs> in I suppose uh, through the 40s and into the 50s, basically the teaching faculty, uh, the, well they were the attending staff uh, and they also had the role of teaching. Uh, to be on the attending staff uh, at the county hospital required a faculty appointment from a medical school, at that time either College of Medical Evangelists or the University of Southern California. Uh, the uh, voluntary faculty uh, played a very important role in the, obviously in the teaching program. Uh, as the, in moving into the late 50s and early 60s, it became apparent that there needed to be additional full-time faculty. Uh, there had been uh, full-time faculty in the Department of Medicine, starting with Dr. Helen Martin uh, in the 1940s, was the first county employee uh, who was also a full-time faculty of the university. Uh, but by the uh, time I arrived in 1961, uh, there was a, a movement, there had been a movement, and there were a large number of full-time faculty in medicine, for example, and uh, in pediatrics, as uh, Dr. Paul Worley had come and as you had come in the early 1960s. In surgery, there was a much slower uh, movement in that regard. Uh, it was more difficult to recruit surgeons to the county hospital environment, I think, and uh, the voluntary faculty in the surgical disciplines still uh, uh, dominated the, uh, the scene, basically, in the surgical uh, disciplines, I would say. Uh, now, I, I might, at the beginning, sort of define what I mean by, this, by surgery, because sure. uh, the Department of Surgery at that time, 1961, consisted of uh, general surgery, which would include pediatrics, well, it included surgery, which would include pediatrics, thoracic, uh, plastic and reconstructive as, as it existed at that moment, vascular disease, trauma, gastrointestinal, endocrine surgery. And then there were the surgical specialties of urology, orthopedics, neurosurgery, ophthalmology, and otolaryngology. All of those five, and I will from henceforth refer to them as the surgical specialties, all of those surgical specialties were divisions in the Department of Surgery. And at that time, in 1961, I believe that the chairman of each of those divisions was a member of the voluntary faculty, including Dr. Clarence Byrne, Dr. C.J. Byrne, uh, who was chairman of the Department of Surgery. Uh, there had been a movement, however, and in 1956, I believe, Dr. Leonard Rosoff had been recruited 
uh, by uh, Dr. Byrne and by Dr. Roger Eggerberg, who was then medical director of the county hospital. Uh, he had been recruited as the chief of surgery, the first time, full, first full-time person as a chief of surgery, at the, as chief of surgery at the county hospital uh, and as professor of surgery at USC. Uh, he then, and subsequently there were recruited uh, head physicians uh, uh, for the various surgical speci specialties as I have defined them. Uh, and those individuals uh, were initially head physicians at the county hospital, but were not the department division heads in the School of Medicine. Uh, the, uh, so that the voluntary faculty still uh, played an extremely important role. Uh, the uh, faculty as a whole, the new full-time faculty coming in who were joint county employees, university employees, and full-time faculty, uh, they had very limited private practice, if any. In most instances, had they had no private practice. Basically, were based uh, totally at the county at the county hospital. Uh, there was not a uh, uh, a means for them to engage in practice. Really, there was one small examining room over in the Ralston building on the campus, and right. that was that was it. One one examining room with no staff. Uh, the research space available. Uh, the laboratory in which we worked, which I mentioned at the, the estrogen project, uh, metabolism and breast cancer project, we were in the first floor of the old jail building at the corner of Mission and Marengo, and each of us had a cell as our uh, little office. <laughs> uh, but there was no, uh, there were, in 1961, there was not a facility for research for the clinical faculty on the basics, on the medical school campus. Basic science faculty by that time had uh, Mud and Mal and McKibben, but there were and Ralston and Ralston, right? But uh, which was very limited in terms of its facilities, uh, so that most of the clinical faculty's research was either in the old jail building uh, or in the old CD building on uh, on Zonal Avenue, uh, right. where the, where they had their laboratories. Uh, when did you uh, join the faculty full time then? I joined. I then in 1964. Dr. Byrne and, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Rosoff asked me to join the full-time faculty. At that time, there had been a young man there by the name of Bill Hammond, and he was leaving. But there were at that time two full-time faculty in what I would call the Department of Surgery. Uh, and by then, there was a full-time head physician in each of the surgical specialties. But there were only two faculty in the, uh, in the Department in of the Surgery. Department of Surgery. Right. right. And so you joined in uh, uh, that... Uh, 1964, and uh, did you uh, uh, find the, it different by being a full-time faculty member than when you had done the voluntary and the uh, and the research uh, program? Oh yes, actually the uh, the research program that NIH funding for that program ceased at about that time, and uh, when I be, it, di it did cease at that time when I uh, came on the full-time faculty, and. Uh, uh, on the full-time faculty, I, uh, well, the, the various, there were seven general surgical services at the county hospital, uh, one for every day of the week, and uh, the, uh, there was a senior attending from the voluntary faculty basically on each service, and Dr. Rosoff as a full-time was senior attending on a service. Uh, on a, and when I came on the full-time faculty, I became the senior person on a service. So I basically had the responsibility for one of the uh, one of those services. One of those days. Yes. One of those days, and uh, of course, assumed additional responsibilities with respect to teaching. Uh, I continued to work with the tumor service, and I, uh, from then for the next ten years, from '64 nine years, I ran a. Uh, clinic in which we, well, it's rather interesting, I, we took care of all of the women with uh, advanced breast cancer and colon cancer. Uh, there was not a medical oncology service at the county hospital. Uh, so that, w that clinic that I ran on Friday afternoons was really the clinic for uh, advanced cancer. Uh, Dr. Jesse Seinfeld had been recruited as head of medical oncology but he was based at the John Wesley Hospital, uh, not at the county. Right, and just parenthetically, 
Jesse went on to be the Surgeon General exactly. of, of the United States. They right? would only, at, at the, he would only take to programs at the uh, John Wesley patients that were going to go on to randomize or, or on to clinical trials. Uh, so that the rest of the patients uh, in that in area ended up in my clinic at the, yeah, at the, right, at the county hospital. Right. Exactly. Yeah. How did you get engaged uh, uh, with the student teaching and so on, other than the kind of resident teaching that went on at the county? I mean, you obviously had uh, students in their surgical uh, During rotations. Their surgical rotations. Uh, well, I, I think that probably would uh, relate to Franz Bauer <laughs> in that. Uh, uh, Franz, uh, I don't remember who had been chairman of the curriculum committee, uh, but Franz uh, asked me to become chairman of the, well, I, I was on the curriculum committee and asked me to become chairman of the curriculum committee. Uh, I suppose we might talk about that. I uh, think that would be a good time right because now, this was, uh, 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 it was actually Roger who started uh, saying we should look at the curriculum and change it. Exactly. Uh, in fact, I guess it was it was Roger who would have asked me to become chairman. Right. It was Roger, uh, not Fran. Uh, the uh, yes, the curriculum at that time uh, in 1960, late 1960s, uh, the first two years, the basic science departments had block time, which were totally under their control, and they taught uh, whatever they felt was important to their discipline during their period of block time. Uh, the clinical departments uh, had clerkships in the third and the fourth year, but in the third year, the students were re pulled from their clinical responsibilities every afternoon uh, for lectures uh, by the various clinical departments, or there was an interdisciplinary program called Introduction to uh, Review of Systems, in which uh, uh, I might come back to that in a moment, but uh, the so that the students on their clerkship really were not able to be fully part of a clinical team because in the afternoon maybe their patients was going to the operating room, they had to go to a lecture. Or the team they were assigned to uh, were, uh, go, had their clinic that afternoon and they couldn't attend the clinic. So it was a very, led for a disjointed clinical experience. Uh, the program, the review of systems was a program that was uh, it was uh, handled by Dr. Pete Reynolds and Dr. Helen Martin. Both and distinguished professors both distinguished of medicine. Both distinguished professors of medicine. And I would just as a little anecdote, uh, when I uh, first went on the full-time faculty, Dr. Byrne uh, informed me that I would uh, be the surgical participant in this team effort of review of systems and for the section on fluid and electrolytes. And at the first planning session uh, for that year, uh, Dr. Reynolds, who uh, many people looking at this uh, video would probably have known, uh, said, Donovan, you'll give the lecture on potassium, uh, which would be, was a one-hour lecture. <laughs> and, uh, I took a little preparation for me to uh, <laughs> give a one lecture. Right. But anyway, going back to the curriculum, the curriculum uh, committee then uh, uh, looked at the subject of what should be done to the curriculum. And what evolved was a plan. Uh, and Although I was chairman of the committee, I will not take responsibility for the plan. The people m deeply involved in the planning for this were Steve Abramson, who, was in the, who had been brought in as the director of Office of Research and Medical Education, uh, orthopedic, uh, orthopedic surgeon from Arcadia, a young uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll think I, of his name. We'll think of his name, right. uh, our senior moment. Uh, uh, was very important. Lauren Stevens. Lauren Stevens. Lauren Stevens. Uh, uh, Dr. Barbara Korsh uh, was very from much the children's hospital. from Children's Hospital was very much involved. Peter Lee uh, very much involved. Uh, but what evolved was a uh, program which would be in the first two years there would be interdisciplinary teaching involving the basic science departments uh, in the first and second year together with clinical departments uh, which would uh, present the basic science aspects and clinical correlations of basic science. Uh, throughout these first two years, uh, in the first year being, for example, anatomy, biochemistry, and microbiology, and the second year, pharmacology, pathology, and... Uh, uh, Physiology, I think, it yeah, was in the first. Right, but, yeah. yes, in the first year. Uh, and then a very important part of the curriculum was a program called Introduction to Clinical Medicine, which uh, Barbara Korsh was very much involved in, uh, in, in developing. 
And this was a program where students were taken in, in small groups, four to five students with a faculty member, and they uh, went through introduction to clinical medicine paralleling the system review in the, of the multidisciplinary uh, clinical and basic science and clinical presentations. Uh, for example, uh, and hematology, uh, when they were, that was being discussed, then the students would learn about blood counts and, uh, and, and so that physical examination, for example, during cardio, uh, cardiovascular disease, they'd learn the examination of the heart and the vascular system. Uh, this program was enormously successful. It's continued to the present time has actually been adopted and copied by many other uh, medical it, schools. It was introduced, I think, in, in 1969 as the f doing just the first year, and right. then you'd add a year each, each year. Each year. So, exactly. so it took exactly. us it's to right. about 73 or 4 right. before it, it finally was completed. Uh, and the, but the other major change was that all lectures were, were abolished in the third year. Right. So that, and there was uh, a major amount of elective time uh, programmed in and the students could take their sequence of clerkships in elective time sort of at their choice. They might take surgery in their third year or they might take it at the end of the of the fourth year yeah. depending on some what on what their career choices were and what their uh, goals were. Uh, this meant that the students now were really part of the team of the clinical team on the services at the at the county hospital right. and uh, made a tremendous difference. Yeah. I uh, uh, have been interested to see that a number of medical schools have in the last uh, uh, 10 years or 15 years adopted that kind of a program as a new curriculum and we exactly. kept saying that was the new curriculum in 1969. Exactly. And the, the curriculum at USC has been modified over the years and there's a couple of years ago there was sort of a major sort of relook at it but it, it's still the same basic curriculum. Right. Now I might go on to say that the basic science uh, chairman uh, the less than enthusiastic, let us say, about the loss of autonomy with the new curriculum, as were some of the clinical departments. I should say notably medicine. Dr. Bram, who was chairman of medicine at the time, was not enthusiastic about the new curriculum. Uh, Dr. Eggerberg, uh, in June, was uh, uh, stepped down and moved to Washington as the assistant secretary of HEW. And I think his last act before leaving for Washington uh, was to say that the new curriculum will go into effect on September 1st. That's correct. Yeah. Right. No, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And right. it did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What about other uh, things within uh, the school at that time? You were engaged with the research uh, committee and so on? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I said that when I joined the faculty in 1964, Dr. Rosoff and I were the only two full-time faculty members. So every committee of the medical school or the hospital, one of us had to be on, was on the committee, <laughs> for, except for the executive committee, which of course Dr. Byrne served. Uh, a research committee had been set up at the county hospital. I wouldn't know the exact date, but it wouldn't be certainly in the, by the 50s, by the early 50s. And the original reason for that was that there were two schools at the county hospital, uh, USC and College of Medical Evangelists. And the desire was that the uh, two schools, so that the two schools wouldn't be looking at the same clinical material or pursuing the same studies at the same time. And so that there could be some, uh, sort of be a traffic cop who decide who was going to, who was going to do what. Uh, so you wouldn't be like, uh, 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 Charity Hospital in New Orleans, where both Tulane and uh, LSU. LSU sent in abstracts on pancreatic injuries to a uh, surgical meeting at the same time with totally different conclusions, <laughs> and the program <laughs> committee put them both on the program. <laughs> but anyway, the uh, uh, but as that e it evolved, uh, that committee, the county also, the attending staff association, which was the uh, in the professional staff association of the county hospital. Uh, set up a uh, association in which they were, it was separate from the county, basically, but in which they were eligible to accept grants. And a certain number of federal and NIH grants were being awarded to projects being proposed from the county hospital. And so the research committee then assumed the responsibility for reviewing those proposals so that all clinical studies now at the county hospital and, and research proposals were being reviewed by the research committee. Uh, that committee was chaired and the leadership really came from Dr. Helen Martin again, and we might talk about her a little bit later, but uh, 
I succeeded Helen Martin in the late 60s as the chairman of the research committee. In 1972, 1973, there were some, basically some, uh, uh, well, the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, there were some uh, studies involving human subjects uh, which became uh, public knowledge in which there had been inappropriate use of human subjects in research. And the NIH at that time mandated, as we know, that every institution had to have an institutional review committee that would review uh, research involving human subjects. Well, this became very, this was very simple for USC, probably more than perhaps any other school in the country, because we were already doing it uh, and had been doing it for a number of years. So right. our transition to the Institutional Research Committee was, uh, was very simple. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you left uh, USC in 1973 to go to uh, University of South Alabama right. as chairman of surgery. Right. Could you tell us a bit about your tenure there? Well, <laughs> I went as chairman of the Department of Surgery, and uh, one year later I became acting dean, and uh, a couple of years later after that I became the v vice president for health affairs. Uh, but I was c never gave up my chairmanship of the, uh, of the Department of Surgery. Uh, and interesting, uh, uh, when I was Vice President for Health Affairs, the Dean uh, was the Chairman of Medicine, which made for interesting reporting relationships because uh, he reported to me as Dean and I reported to him as Chairman of the Department of Surgery. Uh, and we never had a disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We never had a disagreement. Well, we were fortunate enough to uh, recruit you back as Chair of the Department of Surgery in 1978. And uh, uh, maybe you could Tell us how your vision of the school changed between 73 and 78. Were there changes that had uh, become apparent or not? Well, there were some changes, but uh, during that period of time, it was a period in which there was an enormous increase in the county contract with USC. And there was a vast expansion, of, not vast, but there was a very large expansion of the faculty in uh, departments of medicine, neurology, OBGYN, pediatrics. Uh, coinciding with the, de the departure of CME, uh, College of Medical Evangelists, and the California College of Medicine, the county assuming responsibility for the whole hospital, which had occurred before 73, before I left. But the impact of that and the expansion of the faculty occurred really in the years uh, in the mid-70s. And surgery basically did not participate in that expansion to a significant degree. Uh, Reason being, uh, as I alluded to previously, uh, there was a very limited private practice to almost no private practice for the full-time faculty. Uh, recruitment of faculty was difficult. Uh, only a certain number of full-time faculty could function effectively within the county hospital. Uh, surgeons have to have to operate in right. uh, in, the, in that environment. Uh, so that when I returned in 1979, there were changes in the department of surgery. Uh, in, uh, I sh might go back and say that before that, uh, ophthalmology became a separate department when Dr. Ryan came in 1974. Uh, uh, orthopedic surgery had become a separate department. Dr. Sarmiento had come in the mid-1970s. Uh, 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 neurosurgery and urology and otolaryngology were still divisions in the, de in the department of surgery. Uh, the uh, neurosurgery had now, uh, the chairman of that division had been Ted Kersey and now it was uh, Marty Weiss uh, uh, who were full time. Uh, uh, Paul Harvey was uh, not the head of orthopedics at that time still and uh, Dr. Alden Miller was still, uh, all voluntary faculty was the head of otolaryngology for many years to come. Right. Uh, so it was a bit of a transition. There had been a slight increase in the uh, faculty in what I have defined as surgery, that is general surgery, vascular, thoracic, uh, plastic and reconstructive. Uh, I believe there were now five full, uh, seven full-time faculty uh, uh, in that uh, position, situation. There were at that time 11 full-time positions available through the county as county items which could be used or could be split. Uh, I might just say that one of the limitations of the county system was that if you divided a county item and put each two people on each half time, only one person could have fringe benefits. 
yeah. uh, which was a real, real limitation in the utilization of the county dollars or the county resources to, to expand faculty because you couldn't take a faculty member and put him on 50 percent uh, county item, uh, have him responsible for practice for the remainder of his income because he had no, he'd have no fringe benefits. No benefits. No right. benefits. So that, that was a real limitation. So there had been a slight increase. The Dr. Rosoff, uh, Dr. well, I should mention that Dr. C.J. Byrne, who had been chairman, uh, and we will comment on him later, but uh, he retired in 1969. Dr. Rosoff became uh, chairman in 1969 and was chairman from 69 to 79. As I say, there was a slight increase, about uh, four additional faculty uh, appointed. When I left in 73, we were four and there were seven when I came back right. uh, in, in, in what I've defined as surgery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so not much difference, really. So your, your challenge then as the chair was to increase the faculty in the, in the department? Yeah, we had one thing which I uh, uh, might mention, uh, which was an impo important uh, for the Department of Surgery, and that was uh, when Dr. Eggerberg was dean, so uh, before 1969, about 1966-67, uh, the Donald Baxter Foundation uh, came to him uh, and, th it was, and indicated they would provide support for uh, research. And Dr. Uh, Egerberg, Dr. Eggerberg called me, and we received a grant from the Baxter Foundation at that time, which was very important because the, uh, we had left the jail building and the Hoffman Clinical Science Building had opened. We had a chemistry lab and a uh, animal research laboratory in the Hoffman Building. And the Baxter Grant allowed us to support that with, with basic personnel. Uh, I was doing some work then with uh, uh, reticular endothelial function in breast, patients with breast cancer. And that Baxter Foundation grant uh, continued uh, well into the uh, late 1980s uh, uh, that, uh, and was very important uh, for support for the Department of Surgery. Right. Uh, the, uh, so that when I came back in 1979, I would say there was, uh, the department was not that greatly changed from when I had left in 1973. Yeah. And uh, uh, one of the things that came uh, at that time was uh, the uh, fact that uh, the divisions had separated. Neurosurgery was independent department. Not, not in 79? No. Uh, Ural when I came back in 1979, urology and neurosurgery were still uh, divisions of the Department of Surgery. Now, neurosurgery under Dr. Weiss, however, had uh, expanded significantly. Uh, uh, he had recruited additional faculty. Uh, he had established a significant uh, practice, uh, faculty practice at the Huntington Hospital in Pasadena. Uh, so I would say that neurosurgery had uh, had matured uh, at that time and shortly after that uh, it became a separate department. Uh, urology. You need to have a critical mass in order to have a department. Right. You so can't do it with one person with or, one two. Per or right. two people. And it had, re it had evolved uh, to that point. Urology uh, was still a division in the Department of Surgery. Uh, urology uh, at that time had one half-time faculty member, so it was not uh, at that point uh, uh, appropriate that it would, it was still needed, it was the division now uh, right. in the Department of Surgery. Uh, I guess we might talk about uh, urology Yes, now, how, and how it evolved, point. right. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Rosoff and, uh, had uh, discussed uh, uh, with Dr. Donald Skinner from UCLA uh, the possibility of his coming to USC as chairman of urology. Uh, Dr. Skinner had uh, trained at the Massachusetts General Hospital and uh, had developed a strong urological oncology practice at uh, UCLA. Uh, in 1980, uh, I was able to entice Dr. Skinner with two additional faculty members uh, to come, Dr. Laskowski and uh, joined him uh, to come from UCLA and join us. And uh, you provided us uh, some resources. Uh, I mentioned that uh, there were seven faculty members in the Department of Surgery, but I actually had 11 item numbers from the county. And I took two of those items and gave them to uh, urology to start the program in urology. Uh, 
the uh, well, this leads into Dr. Skinner. Obviously, had, was going to have to have a uh, private, private practice. Private practice, right? And when I had was being recruited uh, by you from Mobile, I said that if I was going to take the position, it had to be we were going to move out and develop a private practice for the Department of Surgery. Uh, this was really made possible by Dr. John Wilson, uh, who perhaps should be mentioned. Uh, Dr. Wilson was the, uh, a senior orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he was a chairman of orthopedic surgery at the Children's Hospital, but mostly he was president of the Good Samaritan Hospital. He was a trustee of the University of Security Pacific Bank. And Dr. Wilson uh, uh, provided us with office space in the old Good Samaritan Hospital building. Uh, and. Uh, Dr. Skinner, and, and they arranged a system where we were uh, appointed to the staff of the Good Samaritan Hospital in a special category. We were not members of the voting members of the medical staff, but we didn't have to pay staff dues either. Oh, that's <laughs> and uh, and uh, so Dr. Skinner and I, we opened the office at the, uh, at the Good Samaritan Hospital. Uh, I might in a moment tell you how we funded that to open it. Uh, well, that's sort of an interesting, but uh, uh, so we had a site then for us to try and develop a faculty practice where the Department of Surgery and, and the urology, and your, which then included two divisions, surgery and urology, right. uh, where we could develop our practice. We funded it because at that time, uh, Dr. Jerry Kay was the head of cardiothoracic surgery at USC. And they could not do pediatric cardiac surgery at the pediatric pavilion at the county hospital. And so the county children who were covered by crippled children that came through that county hospital, he took to St. Vincent's Hospital where he operated. And when I arrived that summer of 79, he came to visit me and he brought me a check, which he said was the fees that he had received the previous year for the county patients, for the county patients at the St. Vincent's Hospital. And I used the money to buy the furniture and to hire someone to staff the office at the, at the Good Samaritan Hospital. So Good for you. That's how we got to go. But anyway, uh, that gave us the opportunity to, uh, uh, and I just, to urology, uh, of course, just uh, Dr. Skinner brought his practice with him, uh, and uh, which was uh, tremendously important. So he didn't have to develop one because he, he already, already had, he already had it, and it, and it just, uh, it, it, it just expanded and grew, and uh, right. as did the Department of Urology. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then when the Norris uh, cancer hospital was able to open, he moved a good well, part he of that. And yes. Uh, when the Norris Cancer Hospital opened, uh, we basically, he moved his practice, which was very substantial, and we moved our practice, which was evolving and, and developing. Uh, when I say our, I'm talking about uh, uh, my practice, Dr. Tom Byrne, Dr. Al Yellen, uh, Dr. Silverman, uh, uh, who were the, basically the four people in, in general surgery and surgery who were engaged in practice. We moved our practice basically to the Norris Hospital. We occasionally did a patient at the Good Sam that was referred from the Good Sam, but right. basically we moved our practice. And then in uh, later when the uh, county sold the land to the university for the development of the county hospital, it included, of course, a number of buildings, including the building uh, over which uh, uh, housed the engineers, and we moved our practice, our office, our business office and such, and they op we opened a clinic in that building right. for the whole faculty to utilize. And, ha as a, uh, and uh, so we moved over there. So we basically moved totally to the university, Norris Hospital. Uh, a certain percentage of patients could be admitted without a diagnosis of cancer. And until the uh, university hospital evolved, it basically was our mini university uh, hospital, hospital right. and, and very important in that regard. The faculty practice plan obviously was important to recruit faculty as well as to generate revenues for the support of the whole school. Um, it was uh, difficult to create a plan that would meet the needs of each of the departments, and maybe you could. You played such a pivotal role in, in trying to do that. You could tell us about the evolution of the faculty practice plan. Well, in, when I had been in Mobile at the University of South Alabama, I mentioned I, we, I went there, but that, I went there when that school was open. Uh, I went and, when I went in 1973, uh, they just had their first year class. So uh, it, that was, an, that was a, an evolving medical school. 
And uh, we had to develop, while I was dean, a faculty practice plan for that school because uh, we were recruiting faculty and opening the school. Uh, we patterned that largely on the program for the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, when we, I came to USC, uh, as I said, in the summer of 1979, uh, we said we were going to establish a practice plan, and we established a practice plan for the Department of Surgery. Uh, the plan that we established for the Department of Surgery, and it was fairly simple to do because it was, it, there were only four of us involved. <laughs> uh, doctors, myself, Dr. Tom Byrne, Al Yellen, and Howard Silverman, uh, and right. Yutsu Lee, uh, Dr. Margaret Yutsu Lee was there, so there were five of us, uh, and Dr. Skinner in the Division of Urology. And the plan we adopted uh, was that we would uh, give 6% uh, to the university. 5% uh, for the dean and 1% discretionary, uh, that we would then pay the expenses of the practice out of the income uh, and allocated it to indiv individuals, basically, based on their expenses. Uh, we would then pay 5% to the department, and then we went into a program in which it was, we call it a decremental increment, in which uh, for the first, uh, you took your AMC, 80th percentile of your AMC faculty salary, and for the first 25 percent of that, uh, you gave, basically, you kept 75 percent, you gave 25 percent to the department, and then it, it, it gradually dropped so that when you got to very high levels of income, the uh, department was going to be keeping about 90 percent of it. Uh, we proposed the, so this, we set this up for the Department of Surgery, and then at your request, we looked at uh, developing it for the faculty as a, as a whole. And the university appointed Dr. Carl Franklin to work with Mr. Kelly from Music Peeler and Garrett and myself to develop the practice plan. Uh, and it's, at the beginning, uh, it was Dr. Franklin's opinion that, well, really, this was very simple. The money just all came to the university. Right. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, there was a little education involved. And I spent many, many hours with Dr. Franklin and uh, Mr. Kelly. And we did come up with a plan which uh, there was basically a, basically a faculty practice plan, which basically said what I have said, 6% uh, to the university, uh, expenses 5% to the department. And then basically it ended up as a split when you finally got through 60% to the individual and 40% to the department. For the, to the, to the department. Right. Uh, there were many other aspects of that practice plan that we, well, there was the basic practice plan, then there was a employment agreement between the uh, practice plan, between the individual and the practice plan, in which the individuals agreed that his entire practice would have to be within the practice plan. Uh, there was then an affiliation agreement between, and it was, it, the, the plan was departmental. Each, right. each department would have would would be could either be a partnership or a corporation. Uh, there was then a agreement between each practice plan and the uh, university, or an affiliation agreement, uh, and then there was a uh, document which which illustrated the, the distribution of funds. So these documents were prepared uh, with the as I say the practice plan, the affiliation agreement, the employment agreement. Uh, they were then uh, submitted to the university and the Board of Trustees in 1983 uh, approved the, this, this practice plan. Uh, uh, incorporated in the practice plan were some other elements. For example, there was a faculty practice council, uh, which would in, be, include the, the, uh, part, the, the senior person for each practice plan, whether they're a partner or right. the head of the corporation. Uh, but it would also include trustees of the university and people of the community to try and involve them in the evolution of the practice plan and the faculty practice. Uh, each practice plan uh, was to have, if the uh, university wished, an assistant treasurer who was appointed by the university. It was to be prospective budgeting uh, based on previous year's uh, uh, collections, etc. Right. Uh, this then was presented to the various departments, <laughs> and it took a few years before a couple of years before the, it finally, it's about 86 before Matured, I think the right. finally, uh, final departments uh, 
some departments that did not have a practice plan of any significance at the time, uh, that was There's a not a stream of income uh, coming in, right? Ophthalmology was separate yes. already. Children's Hospital was not involved in this. Uh, I would say OBGYN was probably the uh, slowest to accept because they had evolved a pretty, uh, a rather extensive practice at the Good Samaritan Hospital. Right. Uh, but eventually, uh, it was after, I think just after you stepped down, they finally all came under the practice plan. So all departments then were under the practice plan. Right. It's, as it has evolved since then, there have been a lot of changes and uh, a lot of the things that were envisioned never really were, like the, the broad-based faculty practice council was never established, but uh, the practice plan was established yeah. the, with the principle of tithing to support the departments in the university, and it provided the basis for what's been the huge expansion of the faculty, really, yeah. the in the The most important the 90s. is the fact, the, the ability yeah. to, to it, it recruit. recruit. It, it, it provided the ability to recruit. You know, I could, I've, I could say, for example, uh, cardiothoracic surgery was always a problem for me uh, because uh, I could not recruit someone for the county hospital and there was no uh, obvious uh, area in which the, the cardiac surgeons were going to be able to function. Right. So that I, uh, basically for cardiothoracic surgery, uh, we entered into a contract basically with the uh, cardiac surgeons at the Good Samaritan Hospital uh, uh, to provide the services at the county hospital. Uh, right. And they had a approved residency, so uh, in our, the county was part of that residency. So it worked. Right. Yeah. And actually, it's in cardiothoracic surgery, one uh, impossible to even uh, adequately compensate them. And I, we arranged for the county to take, I had two uh, county item numbers for thoracic surgery. And we had the county agreed to take those two county item numbers plus the fringe benefits associated with them, signed a contract with the university, and paid those monies to the university, which I then paid back to the uh, thoracic surgery group at the Good Samaritan Hospital. So that was basically the prototype for the subsequent professional service agreement, which transferred the county monies in the late 80s from uh, the county to the university. Uh, and allowed the flexibility then of, of utilizing those funds, uh, right, which right. we didn't have before. So that was really the first uh, s symptom of the subsequent uh, professional services agreement. Who were the people that influenced you most at the university? Well, starting with the Department of Surgery, uh, I would have to start with Dr. C.J. Byrne. Uh, uh, Dr. Byrne, uh, Dr. Byrne had come to uh, USC in 1932 uh, and he had come from Iowa where his chief was Dr. Uh, Rowan and Dr. Charles uh, Rowan had uh, been recruited in 1930 right after the school was reopened uh, as a professor of surgery, as a full-time professor of surgery and Dr. Rowan uh, was, had severe arthritis and was in a wheelchair and uh, he, the moguls, the uh, barons of surgery that be in Los Angeles, uh, you see, uh, recruited the chairman of the Department of Surgery who couldn't go to the operating room uh, because he was confined to a wheelchair. And two years later, he brought his ex-resident uh, from Iowa, Dr. C.J. Byrne, uh, here as, the, uh, as his assistant. And Dr. Byrne would wheel Dr. Rowan uh, through the county hospital in his wheelchair and they were the prototype for Lionel Barrymore and Lou Ayers as uh, Dr. Gillespie and Dr. Kildare. Right. Uh, but Dr. Byrne was a uh, uh, unbelievably uh, uh, astute uh, clinician and teacher. Uh, he had an incredible intellect. Uh, Dr. J. Engelbert Dunphy, uh, chairman of surgery at Cal, eventually once told me he had the finest intellect in American surgery. Uh, and he was an inspiring teacher. Uh, uh, he just would see insights in clinical situations that you would you would just have totally missed. Uh, but he uh, uh, he influenced a whole generation of surgeons. He was chairman for 30 years, and uh, he influenced a whole generation of surgeons trained at the LA County Hospital, who overwhelmingly stayed in Southern California and had a huge impact on the on the practice, the of, practice surgery of surgery in the in the whole of Southern California. Yeah. Uh, 
he had been chairman of surgery at the, uh, in the 73rd evacuation hospital in Burma in uh, World War II, uh, where a number of surgeons were uh, impor important members of the faculty, Dr. Rosoff, Dr. William Snyder in pediatric surgery, uh, Dr. Fred Likes were all with that uh, unit, as was Dr. Tom Brem, who was subsequently chairman of medicine at USC. Yeah. Uh, so he, uh, I would say then, uh, in surgery, he would clearly be the dominant, uh, dominant figure. Uh, in uh, all of the deans, and for various reasons, I think, uh, you know, I importantly involved. Dr. Dr. Loosely uh, was dean when I came, and uh, his uh, stimulation of the research enterprise of the School of Medicine. Uh, Roger with his uh, expansion of the class size and minority recruitment and curriculum revision and uh, bigger than life <laughs> and uh, projecting into the community. Uh, Franz with the expansion of the huge expansion of the uh, uh, program at the county, county hospital. Right. And then importantly you with the uh, decisions with respect to the Norris Cancer Hospital, the development of the practice plan, the uh, development of the university hospital. Uh, other uh, so other people that perhaps uh, could, should be mentioned, uh, I mentioned Tom Brem. Uh, he was a very important person for the School of Medicine. Uh, he came as chairman of medicine in the 50s, uh, and he then recruited a very, very strong division chairman in the Department of Medicine. I mean, Sam Rappaport, George Friu in, in hematology, George Friu in uh, rheumatology, immunology, Dave Blankenhorn. Uh, 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 Don Nelson, Jack Bethune, John Nikoloff, uh, you can just uh, go down the line. He, uh, he laid the foundation for a very strong department of medicine. Uh, Hugh Edmondson. Uh, in pathology. In pathology, chairman of pathology. Uh, one of the first uh, faculty appoint, full-time faculty appointments at, uh, at, at USC, I think, back in the 30s he, yes. uh, he was appointed. But he was a man of great character. Uh, and uh, impeccable integrity, uh, probably the uh, foremost hepatopathologist in the world in his lifetime. But he provided a significant leadership, I think, in the School of Medicine. He was independently wealthy. He gave generously to the, uh, to the School of Medicine. Uh, uh, a large uh, part uh, to the recruitment of the Doheny to come yeah, to uh, he university. Was, he, he, he was key in that. Key in that. Uh, through uh, Father Ward right, uh, right. and Estelle Doheny, uh, right. Father Ward being Estelle Doheny's uh, confessor and uh, right. Hugh Edmondson's friend, isn't that, right. a, isn't that about it? That's it. And there was a lawyer involved too, I think, yes, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, two other teachers, people who really I think were uh, Pete Reynolds, who uh, uh, was a uh, extremely effective, of course an outstanding hepatologist, but a very effective teacher and uh, uh, leader, and, and Helen Martin, who uh, Again, was I think the f she was the first full-time county employee, simultaneous full-time faculty member, uh, who ran the diabetes service at the county hospital. But uh, uh, she uh, she provided leadership, and she again had great integrity and uh, and uh, everybody re great respect. She, I might add, was the uh, she believed that the faculty needed a stronger voice. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, you in the right. administration, <laughs> but uh, I think it was in. Actually, it was during. Uh, it was before you were dean. It was before you were dean. Uh, she was the uh, person who really started the medical faculty association. Uh, is that she thought the faculty should have some form of a structured association, separate from the faculty senate, for example, right. uh, but one unique to the school of medicine uh, that could bring the faculty's concerns to the administration in a, in a, in a sort of an organized uh, fashion. Uh, and she was the first president of that association, and I think I was the second president. Uh, Steve Abramson, either Steve or I, but right. first, second, three, it was, you know, it was Helen, myself, and Steve uh, right. uh, as that organization. Uh, I was president, uh, I was president uh, during the, when Nixon decided to bomb Cam <laughs> Cambodia. Right. <laughs> And the students erupted in, uh, in, in great indignation and uh, demanded that we take a position. And, uh, oh, so they did. And, and, oh, yeah. and uh, as I remember, uh, <laughs> I was an associate dean. It was uh, my first kind of uh, uh, challenge. I was uh, asked by the students to send five of them to Washington to protest right. this. 
and uh, I said I would pay half their way. Right. But they'd have to pay the other half. Right. Well, they were having trouble coming up with that money. And I said you had to represent the whole student body. <laughs> the the ten percent who feel like you, the ten percent who are in favor of Mr. Nixon's position, and the eighty percent who are trying to finish this school year and pass their exams. Right. And we're not taking a position one way or the other. So I never had to send them to Washington. It was the uh, it was during about that same period of time that the students invited Robert Applebnap, of his name, the head of the Communist Party in California, to right. speak to them on, right. on certain subjects, and uh, he spoke on a Sunday evening uh, in the Siva Residence Hall, as I recall. And the following morning, Roger Egerberry had a call from Blanche Siva, who was uh, slightly to the right of uh, <laughs> Tillotha, and wondering how it was possible that the head of the Communist Party uh, had managed to be invited to speak in the building dedicated to the memory of her dear departed husband. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other things that you'd like to tell us about your uh, time there? You retired well, in 1990? Well, yeah. Oh, in terms, I think, uh, the evolution of the Department of Surgery uh, from 79 till 90, uh, one was the establishment of the, of the practice plan. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that I had 11 item numbers, and I gave two to development of the Division of Urology, uh, which remained part of the Department of Surgery until I stepped down in 1990 when it became a separate uh, department. Up until then, Don Skinner preferred to have me have to go to all the meetings, and he didn't have right. to go to them. Uh, the other uh, area in which there was a, I perceived a significant void uh, when I came back uh, in 1990, uh, was in plastic and reconstructive surgery. Plastic and reconstructive surgery had d evolved into a, an important discipline of, of uh, not the uh, plastic so much, but from the academic point of view, but the reconstructive uh, surgery. Uh, uh, breast reconstruction, for example, for mastectomy, uh, for example. And uh, Dr. John Goyne, a very fine plastic surgeon, uh, practiced at the Good Samaritan Hospital, and as a member of the voluntary faculty, basically was the uh, division. division of plastic right, surgery. Right. There, w there was none. There, w there was no, and in the entire uh, Southern California area uh, of the Los Angeles area of uh, X million people, seven million people, the only program in plastic and reconstructive surgery was at UCLA. So I thought I perceived this as a real need, and again, working with you as dean. Uh, I took two, the two other item numbers I had and recruited Dr. Tom Krizik from uh, Columbia University as uh, chairman of a division of uh, plastic and reconstructive surgery. Uh, and that division, of course, took off and it, it just, uh, just explode, it just grew. It's, uh, and again, uh, Dr. Krizik worked with, we had the practice, he, he actually, uh, did his practice with Dr. Join, John Goyne's office because they had uh, no patient surgery ability, uh, but so didn't use our practice at the office at the Good Sam. But uh, Dr. Krizik subsequently left, went to the University of Chicago. Dr. John Reinish, who we had recruited as head of plastic surgery at Children's Hospital, took over as chairman of the division, and now Dr. Randy Sherman is uh, the chairman. But uh, so that. Uh, the major growth in what was the Department of Surgery as I arrived uh, basically was more in the two areas that were essentially non-existent uh, when I came, namely urology and, and plastic surgery. Uh, we did begin to expand in the uh, division of surgery. Uh, we recruited in vascular surgery, uh, uh, recruited in, in trauma, uh, but uh, our practice was beginning, private practice was beginning to expand, but it has not expanded at a rate without the university hospital. It had not expanded at the rate in which we could recruit m many additional surgeons based on our, our uh, on, the, on the expanding practice. Right. So that surgery did not expand to the extent that, uh, uh, as, as did uh, urology and, uh, and the plastic other surgery, right. the other, yeah. the other yeah. two uh, right. uh, components of the plan. Uh, I would think those of them would be the, uh, because of the, uh, during that period, I should say, I said neurosurgery became an independent department, and uh, ENT, uh, otolaryngology, uh, when Dr. Alton Miller stepped down, became a separate uh, department. So uh, by the end of my tenure in 1990 with urology going, 
all of what I originally defined as specialties were now separate departments, which is characteristic of medical schools throughout the country. That's, uh, right. that's evolved, basically. Yeah. Have you kept involved with USC since your retirement? Uh, when I retired, I said that ex-chairmen should be like old elephants and wander off into the sunset. And uh, I, uh, yes, I've become remained involved with USC. I have a very good relationship. I've given give grand rounds. I've given grand rounds on occasion, uh, but I have not. Uh, well, uh, I continued some private practice for a couple of years after 1990, after I retired. But after I uh, retired from private practice, uh, I basically w didn't not remain involved actively in the clinical programs at USC. Uh, I remained active in support of them, but uh, not in the clinical programs. And uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I now uh, uh, conduct a conference for residents at the Huntington Hospital, which is uh, half the faculty, a full-time faculty at USC, so I uh, am involved in that right. sense. And, and in your retirement, did you also not uh, work with uh, Drew uh, Martin? Well, Lincoln? yes. I, uh, well, I did two other things in my retirement. One, in the early years, uh, I worked with the RAND Corporation. And I worked with the RAND Corporation on some proposals to uh, uh, Bureau of uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services on uh, updating the relative value scale f uh, for, f uh, physician, for physician reimbursement under Medicare. And then I, uh, I did go down and uh, participated in a teaching conference at uh, the King Drew Medical uh, School for a number of years. Uh, I went down there once or twice a week. Yeah. Right. The uh, one other th uh, area that we didn't mention in terms of surgery, uh, perhaps we shouldn't mention, uh, is the Society of Graduate Surgeons. Uh, yes, tell us about uh, that. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Uh, the Society of Graduate Surgeons was founded uh, uh, back in the 50s uh, as a uh, alumni group of individuals finishing the residency at the uh, at the LA County Hospital uh, and uh, it was founded basically uh, to provide a venue for continuing medical education for surgeons and uh, it developed a surgical forum which uh, was conducted every year from the 1950s uh, to the 1990s in which they brought together uh, five surgeons and one non-surgeon every year for a one-week uh, continuing education program, which was enormously successful in its, in its early years. And, uh, and it brought uh, surgeons from out the country and out the world to Los Angeles, where they became acquainted with uh, USC, with Dr. Broso with Dr. Byrne and Dr. Rosoff. And uh, I think that it was important uh, from, from that point of view because uh, Dr. Byrne uh, uh, had a very large private practice at the Good Samaritan Hospital, uh, and he was a member of all the national organizations, but he did not participate in things such as the board and the RSC and, uh, and that, sort of, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, Dr. Rosoff became more involved. He was a member of the board. Uh, I became even more involved. Uh, with in the National Society. Society as well, right. as a member of the, and then chairman of the American Board of Surgery, and as a member of the Residential Review Committee uh, for Surgery, and uh, uh, the Board of Governors of the college, and, uh, right. and I even ended up on the American Board of Family Practice representing surgery for five years. But, uh, uh, so I think, this, I think the department uh, over the years that I knew it became more uh, involved uh, nationally and internationally uh, in right. surgery. Yeah. Uh, counter in part was uh, the development of continuing medical education with Phil Manning, as yes. it's said, yes. who uh, brought a number of distinguished uh, individuals. But uh, those were uh, courses that were primarily conducted uh, in in lecture and seminar kind of thing, right. and not in a clinical setting right. like your surgical exactly. forum, where the physicians right. could actually uh, participate. The uh, of course uh, also evolving was the. Uh, the residents are moving out from just the county hospital. Uh, they, for years, had rotated the Good Sam with Dr. Byrne, but then they rotated with us. They rotated to the Norris Cancer Hospital. Uh, now, the University Hospital, they go to the University Hospital. So it's a, it's a much broader uh, graduate education program than, uh, than the one that was based totally, basically, at the county hospital. Right. Well, you've been a wonderful uh, individual to interview, and you've That's spanned important. so many years uh, of history in the Department of Surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.